So here's our staircase. Remember we talked about the terms before, NFIPs, uh, requirements are minimal, and what else? Cumulative. See cumulative? Yeah. They add up. That's what we're seeing here. They're going to add up in our staircase. So we'll go through the staircase and see what we mean by that. So this is our very first one. By the way, this is a very important number. Everything in the NFIP is contained within 44 CFR. We know what that stands for? Code of Federal Regulations. Code of Federal Regulations. Yeah. So if somebody says something about the NFIP, you can bet it's in 44 CFR. Now there's a whole subsection, 60, 70, but it's all found in 44 CFR. So our very first step, keep in mind, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at a step. No map. 60.3a says, I don't have a map. My development is so new, or my county, my municipality is so new to the NFIP, we don't have a map. And there's still areas that don't have a map. So if I don't have a map, my community official could be my building official, floodplain administrator, mayor, whoever's tasked with being the community official has to deem that things are reasonably safe from flooding. My God, that's a heck of a responsibility. All of a sudden, you don't even have a map, and you have to determine that somewhere is reasonably safe from flooding? Wow. I don't want to be the building official in that community, because you, you skate between two things. Yeah, I can instantly tell everybody, hey, I want to see everything at 10 feet, just to ensure that it's, oh, okay, then immediately everybody's going to complain, that's ridiculous, I'm going to have to spend so much more money to build there. Okay, so everybody can build at one foot. Then the next rainy season, all the houses flood. And they're like, you didn't know what you were doing. You should have made us build higher. You always get blamed, no matter what. So can you imagine in a community where there's no map? That's a heck of a responsibility. But I still have to adhere to all these other items. The Clean Water Act, which, who enforces that? USACE. United States Army Corps of Engineers. The ESA, we just talked about that, the Endangered Species Act. There's our Navigable Stream Act again from 1899. Prohibits the construction of any bridge, dam, dike, or causeway over or in navigable waters of the United States without congressional approval. So see, you thought I was boring you with all this history lesson at the beginning, and that's how all this ties back together. It was a real page turner along the way, wasn't it? <laughs> And then finally, we have EO 11988. Anybody ever heard of that before? Yes. Executive Order, that's what EO stands for. Executive Order 11988 requires federal agencies to check to see if a proposed project is in the floodplain, the 100 and the 500 year floodplain, even the most rarest of floods, the 500 year, and review alternate sites. So at the one class, I said, you know, a good example of this is I'm building a federal prison. I don't want to build it in the floodplain. And half the class said, why is that such a bad idea? I was like, okay, so, so maybe we do want prisons in the floodplain. Everybody said, so, you know, the prisons, what do we care? So, but do I want to build a federal project? What if I'm building a really nice federal library? I build a 100-year floodplain. Two years later, I've used all this federal money and it floods. What if I build something worse? What if I'm building a nuclear power plant? And I'm like, hey, this is a perfect location. Look, it's low. Nobody wants to build here. It's easy to get cooling water. We can bring it in. Yeah, I'm building it in the 100 or the 500 year floodplain. I'm using federal money for that. Two years later, the place floods and it's totally worthless. That executive order says that if I'm doing any federal projects, I have to research the site and see if there's alternate locations. Very important to remember. That was just modified recently. President Obama signed some other caveats to it, but the underlying idea remains the same. If I'm using federal money, if I'm building a federal project, I have to make sure that it's not within those two, and if it is, I have to have a good reason why it can't go somewhere else. So my next step, I'm at approximate A zones only. I, re I require a permit now. I'm going to say, hey, you got to have a permit if you want to build here. And I'm going to require you, Mr. Developer, Mrs. Developer, Mr. or Mrs. Contractor, to provide me with base flood elevations. I don't have a map, but I'm going to provide, I'm going to require you to tell me what you're going to build at. 
And I set that parameter on this, and you're going to have to commit this to memory because it's not written down anywhere, but my dividing area is 50 lots, individual lots, or 5 acres, whichever is less. So if you're the floodplain administrator and somebody comes into your office and says, hey, I want to build a development and it's going to have 52 homes in them, what are you going to tell them? You're going to have to provide me with BFE data. I don't know how you're going to get it. You're going to have to hire some engineers. They're going to have to review some things. They're going to have to do their own science, their own surveys, because we don't have a map. But you're going to have to develop some base flood elevation data. What if that guy says, well, I'm going to drop it down to 49 lots. Does he still have to do that? No. What if he has... It depends on what his five acres is. What's that? Well, that's the parameter. It's either greater than 50 lots or five acres, whichever is less. But what I'm saying is 49 is still five acres. You still have to do it if it's less than five acres, right? But it says or. Or. No, it's, it's, it's or. So if he has 49 lots and six acres, he's okay. If he has okay, 51 lots and four acres, he still needs to do it. Uh, he doesn't need to do it. It's whichever is less of the two. Right. But that's, a, that's a, the important number you have to remember. Because that's not written down anywhere. That's just a given based on the parameters of development. So then I make it up to 60.3C. I've now developed zone AE. I've got BFEs. I've developed base flood elevation. So somewhere along there I've said, okay, now I know what I want people to build at. I don't have any floodways, though. I haven't delineated that on my maps. And I don't have a velocity zone yet. But I now know that I want my lowest floor at or above base flood elevation. I now have to keep record of my low floor elevations. What, what do I use to maintain records? What's the document? Elevation certificates. Elevation certificates. So I'm going to start collecting those now. How long do I have to hold on to elevation certificates? Indefinitely. There's no statute of limitations. I start to have rules for manufactured homes. I can't just back in a double wide and say, hey, I'm done. They have to adhere to some of the same requirements. I start to have requirements for areas beneath my lowest floor. If I have an elevated structure, I can't just fill in that area. And I have AO zone rules. What, remember what AO was? Challenge. That is a flow. Do I have a BFE in AO? No, no. no yeah. I have what? Yeah. 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 Here's some additional considerations. I'm still in 60.3. Here's some additional considerations. And many of you probably know these better than I do. Vetting requirements. Two vents. Yeah, vents. What are those? I had I actually had somebody the other day in my office call them hydro, hydraulic ports. Oh, they got it. Like how long have you worked here? They're not hydraulic ports. I imagine like they're running hydraulic fluid into them. I'm like, no. What's that 60.3? Like, are you going to ask us or that should, you're just telling us? What is that well, no, that's where it comes from. That's the in that specific code of federal regulations. See, okay, so that's, it's all 44, that's 44 CFR, CFR. That's, that's A, okay. that's B, C. Okay. Those are intentionally separated like that. Okay. Yeah, so how many hydraulic ports? I mean, a hydraulic port is a connection on a piece of machinery where, like, on a PTO, a power takeoff or something. Not, not a hydrostatic vent. I fired that person the next day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Minimum of two vents. The bottom of which is no higher than one foot above grade, a net area of one square inch for every square foot of enclosed area, <coughs> and the vent covering must allow auto entry and exit of flood monitors. <laughs> <laughs> so if I have a thousand square feet of area, how many square inches of venting do I have? Depends on what kind of vent is. One well, <laughs> according to the, to the example you the divide, the it depends on the, whether it's concrete block or well, but don't don't confuse the issue because we have that with surveyors in our area too. They turn a concrete block on their side. There's still a web. They don't have. In general, though, it's one square inch for one square foot of floor space. Whether you have the auto entry, the auto entry is required if you have a, a design there. If I just have a concrete block open, nothing says I have to put something over it. 
The flip push, side is, I was telling some of you at the break, a friend of mine asked me to go look at a house with him a while back, so we went to the house. There's pieces of plywood zip-tied on all the hydrostatic vent openings. They just had concrete blocks on their side. And I said, you're going to have to correct that. And the realtor chimes in. She's like, oh, no, the homeowners association said they can do that because they were getting a lot of insects in their garage. I was like, well, I was telling them, I said, I don't want to be that guy. But I said, well, you, that's not really a homeowners association decision. That's kind of an NFIP thing for the flood water to be able to come in. And she's like, really? I thought those were just for air to come in. I'm like, no, you can just put your garage door up if you want that. So, does Florida have an insect screen mandate? Yeah, it's over. It's under a bend. You can't just put a block. And the, that's where the that's where the gray area comes in because you if you're trying to meet one requirement, you have the insect screen. If you're trying to meet the idea that that potentially could block debris from in there, and then somebody researches so far as to say, well, the insect screen is only required for habitable areas. Then somebody said, well, your garage isn't habitable. And obviously, you can't use vents in a climate-controlled, habitable area. So well, we go actually a dimension on the screen. Oh yeah. Well, and then we've had surveyors that said, "I don't know how to measure that." Because years ago, we were having problems with people were just turning a concrete block on their side and still calling it what 128 square inches. Mm -hmm. And at the county, we were saying that's not 120 square eight square inches because you've got the webbing around there. Oh come on, you're going to be that picky. I'm like, well, yeah, we are, yeah. I was like, is your surveyor going to sign that that's 128? And the surveyor's like, no, I'm not, because it's not. I was like, there you go. Yeah, we're going to be that picky. I was like, when you find a design professional that stamps that that's 128 square inches, I said, you're not going to find that. We also introduced recreational vehicles in this park. RVs, who cares about those? Well, you care about them when they're parked in the special flood hazard area long term. So the rule says they can be on site fewer than 180 consecutive days and fully licensed and ready for highway use. Or they must meet the permanent requirements for permanent construction. So that means I'm able to go to any RV park in the special flood hazard area and say, that thing needs to be able to be roadworthy and start up and move and not be here longer than 180 days. Now, if I go there and he's got a dead battery, am I going to write him a citation? Probably not. But if I go there and the Jump. wheels are off and they're skirting around it and there's an above ground pool built into it and a wooden <laughs> deck wraps around the whole thing and he tells me, oh, I can have this thing on the road in a day or two. Yeah, sure. You know, it's sunk in. The axles are sunk four feet into the ground. It's not going to happen. So those are the important numbers. Those, once again, you have to remember because they're just not written down anymore. 180 days, fully roadworthy, licensed, ready for highway use, or <coughs> permanent foundation requirement. Bless you. We're at 6.3 D. BFEs and floodways, but no zone B yet. Here we have to select and adopt a regulatory floodway, and we prohibit encroachments. Pretty straightforward. And then finally, we add B zones to all this. So we have velocity zones. Now that doesn't mean if you don't live on the coast, you may not have velocity zones, but if you're a coastal community that has reached this point in the step staircase, you're gonna have recommendations and requirements for B zones that include bottom of the lowest horizontal structural member at or above BFE. New construction must be landward of high tide. If I'm building the B zone, I have to have an engineering certification. Everybody know what that is? That's an official FEMA form, an official FEMA document that says the construction of this structure in the B zone meets this requirements, and an engineer has signed and sealed, or an architect has signed and sealed this uh, certification. That is an actual certificate. Remember I said your no-rise is an engineering report, but that's not an actual certificate. This actually is a certificate. No obstructions below the base flood elevation. So if I'm building in the base flood, I can't have something solid. I can't have uh, areas built with these. Like if I have a B zone elevated home, I can't have enclosures. And I can't bring in fill for structural support. If I'm building in the velocity zone, I can't just truck in tons of dirt to provide support for my structure. Because the idea is that it's probably going to scour and, and wash away the first time there's an event anyway. 
Related to that, that last one is my designation. This probably looks familiar because it comes off the elevation certificate. Uh, the idea of how I rate these buildings, A zones or B zones, and where I'm taking my measurement. When we talk about the bottom, the lowest floor, A zones, I'm at the top of my finished floor slab. B zones, if I have a slab on grade, it's the bottom underside of the slab. Okay. Now, I know that, that looks counterintuitive, doesn't it? That you'd say, wait a minute, I can't have a slab on grade in a B zone. Yeah. Believe it or not, you can because base flood may be down here. And we actually have that in parts of Florida where the homes are built slab on grade up on top of sand dunes, the old historic dunes. Now they have slab on grade. They also have micro piles or pilings under them to support them, to prevent them from washing out. But when you tell people, hey, you can't have a slab on grade in the B zone, you can as long as the bottom of the slab is above whatever the elevation requirement might be. Mike, can you repeat that again? You said for zone Zone A, it has zone to be a, at the top of the... It's the finished floor elevation. So in zone A, floor, okay. here's my finished floor. It's the top of that. That very same house in the V zone, I'm measuring at the bottom of that. The bottom slab. of the finished floor. The bottom of the concrete slab. The bottom of the floor. Bottom of the, okay. Yeah, the bottom of the floor. But that bottom floor. has to be above the uh, Correct. And, and it doesn't depict it. Yeah, that's it's not the, the same. Step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't make the draw. <laughs> I just want to make sure that yeah. it's clear. It's the bottom one. So that's not right. 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 Low that's horizontal rare. structural. Yeah. That's yeah. rare. <coughs> yeah, I, but, but in all of Florida, I think there's probably 50 homes that are like right. this. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hear about it until Jim Shock. I was teaching this class like five or six years ago, and I was like, I don't think you can have a slab of green in the B zone. <laughs> The guy's been around the state before forever. He goes, yeah, I got like 19 of them in my jurisdiction. I was like, how old are they? He goes, oh, they were all built in the 80s. St. Augustine. Yeah, yeah that's where they're at. Yeah. St. Augustine. Yeah. And then here's my building with a basement in an A zone. And then finally, a building on piles, piers, and columns. This is what we identify as our lowest horizontal structural member. Is this the finished floor? No, probably not. The finished floor may be up here. But for my measurement, I want the lowest horizontal structural member. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I just wanted to bring it up.